This morning, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them back up with me to Galatians chapter 5. And also you can turn to Mark chapter 10. Galatians 5 and Mark 10. As Ian read to you our passage of Scripture this morning, in Galatians 5, beginning at verse 13, I'd like just to go over it one more time with you. God's Word says, You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge or to serve the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. How important it is that we this morning as a church, we finished our, our series in 1 Thessalonians as we looked at basically the qualities and characteristics, the attributes of, of a healthy church in which a church is to be built on Jesus Christ alone. Last week we started a new series on the one another's as we vertically are in alignment with the things of God and with the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through us individually, we are also called in a relational sense to live out our faith, to live out our faith for the cause of Christ and to do that within a sense of community and for and, and within relationships of grace. And so last Sunday, we talked about the importance of loving one another. This morning, we're going to focus on living out that love in service, serving one another, the second of the one another's found in Holy Scripture. And to serve one another requires a lot of humility, doesn't it? It requires basically us coming to grips with reality. In many ways, it requires us going from an illusion to facing the reality that we were dead in our sins, that we've been made alive now in Jesus Christ, and we've been saved for a reason. We've been saved, if you will, from our sins, but from ourself, and we've been saved to serve. Ultimately, to glorify Christ, that is the main reason, to honor Him, to enjoy Him forever. As a young child, I remember my mother with a catechism over and over and over again. What is the chief end of man, Jim? Mom, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. But you know, as you mature and you get older, you begin to understand the power of that statement. And that is our first and foremost reason each and every day that we awaken and God grants us another day on this earth before He calls us home to be with Him forever. We are called to glorify Him. But we are also saved for another reason, beloved, and that is we are saved to serve one another. And when you come to grips with that reality, it can really cause one's heart to be stressed because we realize it's not about us, but it really is about Him and about service. It requires a sense of surrender in which we surrender over to God control of our life, just as you did when you accepted Him into your life. That moment when you... Uh, knelt down and you prayed, Lord, come into my life. Regenerate my heart. I place my faith and trust in you alone. I'm saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. Lord, I surrender. I raise the white flag and I surrender to your authority. There's a sense of humility there in which we have to bend and our will is changed as we are justified and made right. 
It's a transfer of power. And then we realize that we are called each and every day to walk and to serve the King of Kings, the new commander of our soul. We are no longer captains of our soul. He is in control. But there is a war. <laughs> there is a war that rages, isn't there, beloved? And the Apostle Paul knew this as he was writing to this church at Galatia. This war that rages, known as the sinful nature, known as the philosophy of the world, and also the war, the battle that's against the evil one. This war that rages inside. But Paul comes here in this letter to the church at Galatia, and he is kind of bringing a dose of reality, and he is saying, you are not to serve your flesh. You are not to serve the law. You are no longer in bondage to the law. You're no longer in bondage to your flesh and your sinful nature. But you have been set free to now be a slave to Christ. And you can only imagine the, the struggle and the tension that the church at Galatia had with this. Because this concept of slavery and servanthood was not something that they yearned for. They wanted to be people of position and people of influence. They wanted to be people that were ascending into greatness. But here comes the Apostle Paul and he is teaching them that one of the main characteristics of a godly and holy and vibrant church is a church that is serving one another and is no longer seeking to serve self. And Paul is cutting and slicing away the excess. And he is purifying in their minds what a biblical church is called to do and be. This is hard because oftentimes we have more maybe a, a, a higher view of self and we don't like to think of servant of being a servant and of service we want to think about the things that we can receive and Muhammad Ali I heard a funny story as I was reading this week Muhammad Ali after one of his fights that he had won was on the airplane and he was sitting there in the airplane and the stewardess came up to him and asked him to please put on his, his seat belt please put on the belt and, and Ali said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And the stewardess looked at him and said, well, Superman don't need no airplane either. <laughs> now put on your seatbelt. I mean, think about that. That's a dose of reality, isn't it? That's from being a little bit disillusioned or illusioned and then all of a sudden facing reality. Superman don't need no airplane. Well, there's a sense in which this is exactly what the Apostle Paul is doing here at, with the church of Galatia, is he is coming in and he is saying, this is really what it is about. It's not what the Romans are doing. It's not what the Jews are doing and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's not the traditionalism of your past. It is about grace and faith and mercy and love. And that love is to be lived out in service to community. You are literally to be poured out, Romans teaches us, as a drink offering. This is counterculture stuff. It's radically shifting their view. It is going from a worldview of humanism to a biblical life and worldview, a Christian world and life view of service. And so this is what we want to talk about this morning as we focus in on serving one another. Look with me again at Galatians chapter 5 and also hold on to Mark chapter 10. First of all, Paul is teaching the church at Galatia, do not serve or indulge the flesh. Look at verse 13. 
when he uses these words. You were granted freedom, but freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another. Do not indulge the sinful nature. So the first point this morning is very simple. It's right out of Scripture. It's what Paul was telling the church at Galatia when he said, do not serve or do not gratify or do not indulge your flesh or your sinful nature. And what were certain examples of this sinful nature? Jump down with me to this beautiful chapter to beginning in verse 19. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, and the like. These are all examples. The Apostle Paul is reminding the church of the sinful nature and of our flesh. And our flesh rages war each and every day. That old nature. Even though Christ has penetrated our heart and He has regenerated us and He has called us, we still are at war with our old nature. We are called to mortify it, to crucify it. Each and every day, the ways that we go about doing that are through spending time in God's Word. We are asking God's Word, the sword of the Spirit, to literally cut out part of that old nature, that, that flesh, that nature that rages war. Romans 7 is a great example. When the greatest leader of all time in the current time frame, the Apostle Paul said what? I do the things I do not want to do. O oh, wretched man that I am, who can set me free from this body of death? And the answer was who, beloved? Christ Jesus. That is He. It is only through Him that I am set free. So Paul is reminding this church, first and foremost, do not gratify the desires of your flesh. These sinful habits will destroy each other and the church. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed. There will be dissension. Let it never be named among us that we are biting and destroying one another. Certainly, there's going to be conflict. That is in any healthy family. Certainly, there's going to be disagreement. That is in any healthy family. The Apostle Paul understood this. He was fine with this. But how we work it out must be done with a spirit of service to one another and to Christ. And that's why it's so important. We see the effects of the sinful nature, when, especially in the area of selfish ambition, when you look at the disciples in Mark chapter 10. Please turn with me now to Mark 10. This is the best example of Christians that were close to Jesus not getting it right. Mark 10, beginning in verse 35. Then Jesus, and excuse me, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, now what kind of statement is that? Think about it. We've been with you for three years. Now we want you to do whatever we ask. It's so like us, isn't it? And then he goes on. Teacher, we want you to do what to do for us whatever we ask. Jesus asked, what do you want me to do? They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Amazing. We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, 
You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whatever, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever desires to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Thank you for giving me time to read that because I think it's so important in the context of what Paul is teaching the church at Galatia. Here you have James and John, two of the first disciples, living with Jesus every, each and every day, with him, walking with him, listening to his teaching. That is why we're not immune from this, beloved. We can be in Bible studies and gathering together on Sundays, but we're not immune from the same disease of self-centeredness that James and John had. And what did they ask? They said, Lord, we want to be at your right hand and at your left hand. And if you flash, flash, flash forward, excuse me, move forward to Matthew chapter 28, you'll read another version of this story in which Salome, the mother of James and John, came to Jesus and she said, as a very committed mother would, a mother who loved her children, I want my children to be at your right hand and at your left hand. I want the very best for my children. She was a dedicated, devoted mother, I'm sure, but one thing was missing. She did not come to Jesus and she did not say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my children over to you. Use them however you see fit. And I pray that the greatest use of their service is to serve others. Not to be glorified. Parents, a side note here. I am a parent. I get it. It is difficult. But beloved, that should be our prayer as parents. That God would use our children as He sees fit for His glory through service, not through success, not through status. If success and status come, to God be the glory. But may, let it be our prayer as a covenant church with a covenant family approach that Jesus would use the children of this church for his glory, not for ours. And Jesus, with a spirit of love and a spirit of grace, educates this young mother in Matthew 28. Back to Mark 10, which is the same story, in a sense, in a different angle. You see, James and John were living in the flesh. They were blinded by what, beloved? They were blinded by the values and the ways of the world. They both demonstrated a self-serving attitude and they said, give me, Lord, what I want. We want to sit at your right hand and we want to sit at your left hand. In other words, Jesus, we want the best seats in the house. Is what they were saying. We want to be right up there in the front row with you. And in a sense, as I said last week, we deserve it because we've been with you the longest. We have an entitlement mentality. And Jesus lovingly asked that penetrating question, are you able to drink the cup I'm about to drink? Are you able to share in the baptism and of suffering that I am about to share? And I think through their, their arrogance, they said, of course we are. Now at that moment, Christ could have cut them down. But here is a, is a servant who is still serving, even in the midst of that arrogance. And he lovingly begins to educate them by bringing them together. But what happens through this self-centered act? Also, you have the other ten getting angry, and there's jealousy and there's discord, and there's strife. There's exactly the characteristics that Paul is warning the church at Galatia never to have. 
Let it never be in our body. And when it is, beloved, aggressively attack it with a spirit of grace, just as Jesus did. So first and foremost, we must realize this morning that we're not to serve our flesh, but we're to serve Christ. We must not have the same philosophy and worldview that James and John had here. For they were seeking glory, pursuing positions, not in order to give, but in order to get. At the core of this struggle was the issue of a biblical worldview, a Christ-centered worldview, and a humanistic worldview, a narcissistic worldview. And these two worldviews were colliding, and there's a collision that's going on in our world today, as well as our sinful nature still pulls against the new nature. You see, beloved, God tells us to give ourselves away, doesn't he? He tells us to give ourselves away, but the world says to look out for ourselves. The world tells us to rule. God tells us to serve. The world tells us to be first. God says the first shall be last and the last shall be first. That we are called literally to serve others. And the only way to do that is out of a spirit of love, not out of a spirit of obligation. And it's so important that we realize and understand this. Secondly, this morning, not only are we called not to serve the flesh, but we are called to serve others because we have been set free. You have been set free. Our grace leads to good works. We are saved by faith alone, but not by a faith that stands alone. God has designed us not only to glorify Him, but to serve others. He has literally set us free. D.L. Moody summed it up best, beloved, when he said, The measure of a man is not how many servants he has, but how many men he serves. If you want to train your children in biblical character, and you want to have a church that is built on the character and the foundation of Christ, you will allow that theme to resonate biblically inside your soul. Not the amount of servants that he has, but the amount of people that he serves. The difference between servitude and servanthood is the difference between I've got to, I have to, and I get to. Each and every day, you get to as a result of the freedom that is yours in Jesus Christ. You were once dead inside the prison cell, locked in, bound up, a captive to the things of the world. But then, if you will, the warden came with the keys to eternal life and he unlocked the cell door and he said, you have been set free. There is now no more condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. You are free to leave this prison because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He has purchased you. If you look with me at that last verse of Mark 10, please look with me. If you don't look at anything else this morning, look at verse 30, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom, a ransom for many. He has set you free. He has literally purchased you, beloved, not with gold, not with silver. He has bought you back. Your debt has been canceled. That prison door and cell has been removed. There is no more iron gate between you and Jesus Christ because of his atoning, covering, cleansing work. It is through the mercy and grace that that door has been unlocked. You've been purchased. You've been set free. You are no longer in bondage to your flesh. That's why the Apostle Paul cries out, but thanks be to God. Each and every one of you struggle with sin. You wrestle with the things of the past or you wrestle with the things of the present. And you know those, those hidden sins that you want the light of Christ to shine into. You know those, those desires in which you want to be so successful that sometimes your ambition goes outside the bounds of healthy ambitious ambition. 
All these things are going on in your mind. And God is saying, I have set you free. You are no longer in bondage to your flesh. You're no longer in bondage to legalism and the rules of the day. You're no longer in bondage to the philosophies of the world through Christ and his blood. We are saved and we are set free for one reason, beloved, to serve others. As I close this morning, I ask you, how are you doing that? Are you doing it by carrying a loved one or a friend or a member of this congregation to the hospital because they are unable to drive for the radiation treatment? Are you doing it through giving of food to the hungry? Are you doing it by meeting with a mother with three to five kids who's overwhelmed? Are you doing it by coming alongside of someone and saying, I want to use my talents to help you build something that you need. Maybe it's a bed or a chair. What are you doing as you live out your salvation? Are you, say, are you willing to move into those areas that are somewhat uncomfortable for you? This morning in our new members class, we talked about the four pillars of this church. Evangelism, the Great Commission, the cultural mandate or a biblical world and life view, Christian education or Reformed theology, reverent, honoring worship. And under those four categories are countless ministries and countless opportunities for you to fall in on and serve. As more and more ministry programs come out, and as you think of some, I beg you, as a body of Christ, to find an area to use your talent and your gifts. That is what 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 is all about. You have been saved to serve. You have been set free to share the love of Christ. Do not be self-centered and hold it in. Do not be living each and every day trying to see what you can get versus how you can give. The measure of a person is defined by his ability to give. Jesus is the ultimate example of that servant who came and modeled for us. It is through death that we find life. Let us crucify the flesh and serve others and be thankful that he has bought us back. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we are reminded this morning that it is a church that serves together is a church that also stays together. God, as we, as a congregation here at New Presbyterian Church, let it be our heart's desire this morning to serve one another in love. Let us never repeat the pattern that you warn your disciples to repeat. Let us, God, in a gracious and loving spirit, find ways to honor your name and to fulfill the commission to go out into all the world and to preach and teach and to share the love of Christ to the lost. Bless us and keep us now. And Father, I pray for that one sheep here that even now has not been set free. For that wayward sheep that is outside the fold, who is inside that prison cell, locked, dying inside, but yearning to be set free. I pray with all of my heart through the power of Jesus Christ and the shed blood that even now you would draw that person to your grace and mercy. That even now, Father, at this very moment, if they were seated before you and you asked them that penetrating question, that if you died today, do you know with assurance that you would be with me? And for some here today, God, they do not know that answer. And for some, God, when they are asked, why should I let you into heaven? Why should I allow you into the presence of Almighty God? They will come 
as many of the Gentiles and Sadducees and Pharisees. And they will say, because I have done these things. Father, help them today to see that they are set free only through the blood and the grace of Jesus Christ. And draw their heart even now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.